Hey, so today we're going to make this stylized electricity effect in Blender. The same techniques can be used for realistic electricity as well, and we'll be doing some fun semi-procedural shader shenanigans. So let's jump right in. So I have a scene set up here. This icosphere has a shader similar to the one on my last video with some changes made to it. If you're interested, you can check that video out. But I want to explain how our electricity is going to work first. Now we want electricity that kind of arcs out of the ground and out of objects like this. But we also want electricity that arcs between nearby surfaces, like this ecosphere and the floor that it's nearby. Luckily, we can accomplish both of these with the same technique. Let's say we have some random points all over our scene like this. We can have those points sample outwards in a random direction based on the surface that they're on. For example, this point could look this way, this point could look this way, and this point could look this way. From each point, we want to find the nearest point in our scene again. So from this point, it's right here. From this point, it's right here. And from this point, it's right here. We can then draw lines between these pairs of points to create our electricity. To make the electricity arc out of the surface, we can look at the normal for each point and average our normals. In cases like these where the normals are similar, the average for the normals will also be similar, so our arc of electricity will go like this. Whereas in cases like these, if we average our normals, the average between the two points won't be as extreme, so we'll get a very subtle arc in comparison. And this is how we're going to create all of our curves for the electricity. So let's go ahead and add a new object. It can be any kind of object. I'm actually going to delete the vertices here. I'm going to rename it to electricity. And you want to make sure that your scene that the electricity is going to interact with is inside its own collection. With our electricity object selected, we want to add a new geometry nodes modifier. And I'm going to rename this to electricity. And we're not going to be using this input geometry, so we can go ahead and delete that. I'm going to add a collection info, set to relative position, and select our scene here and realize instances so we can actually use this geometry. By distributing points on faces, we have all of these points that the electricity can spawn in. Now, let's say we only want the electricity to spawn in, in specific areas. I want it to spawn near the ecosphere, but you can use whatever attribute you want here. I'm going to add an object info node, so it's a relative. Pick the ecosphere object, and get the distance between our position and the ecosphere's location. I can then map range this, add a random value node set to boolean, and plug this map range into our probability. What we're doing here is selecting a random true or false value depending on this input right here. For example, where the distance to our ecosphere is one unit, we can have a 0% chance of deleting any particles. Once the distance reaches 1.5 units, we can have a 100% chance of deleting them. If I go ahead and plug this into a delete geometry node right here, you can see that we only have points in a 1 to 1.5 meter area around our ecosphere. And as we move it around, points appear and disappear. Before we delete any geometry, we want to store the index for each point though. And this is to ensure that we have an index for each arc of electricity that doesn't change as the ecosphere moves around. I'm going to set this to integer and call this curve index, and we're going to plug in this index node here. I'm going to organize this a bit more by separating our scene here so we can access this more easily later, and labeling all of this as our distributed points. All right, now to sample in a random direction, I'm going to add a curve line. I'm going to set both the start and end points to zero. I'm going to use a set position node to change the position of one of the endpoints. While you can use endpoint selection to select an endpoint, I'm actually going to use the spline parameter node. And that's because I just think this is easier to visualize, especially later when we need to move the midpoint of the curve around. For now that, I'm going to plug that into our set position, and with this offset, we can now move one of the ends of our curve. Let's add a random value and set it to vector and plug that into our offset here. As we change the seed, you can see that our curve is moving around randomly. To make this easier to visualize, though, we can duplicate our curve a bunch using the instance on points node and the points node right here. Be sure to realize instances like this. And now as we increase the number of points, we increase the number of our curves. You can see that our endpoints are only being offset in the positive xyz directions, and that makes sense because a random value just goes between 0 and 1. If we set the x and y to be negative 1, you can see that they are going in positive and negative x and y directions, but still only the positive z direction. This is actually what we want because we can later rotate this random vector to make sure we are always casting away from the surface of our mesh. And this prevents arcs of electricity from going straight into the interiors of meshes. I don't like this cubish distance that we're searching in though, so I'm going to normalize this. And while it looks like we're randomly sampling in a hemisphere, this is actually not the correct way you would randomly sample in a hemisphere. That said, it doesn't really matter that much for this effect because we don't need accurate distribution. 
We want to scale this vector by some amount, which is how far our electricity will search for other surfaces to chain to. And we want to add an align rotation to vector node here. Rotate vector by this rotation. And now if we change this rotation to something like 1 on the x and 0 on the z, you can see that all of our points are only going in the positive x direction. Now instead of this set of points right here, we're going to plug in our distributed points, and we are going to plug the normal into our align rotation to vector. And you can now see that all of our lines are shooting outwards away from the surfaces that they're on. As we increase the density of our points, you can see that they aren't really going to the ground. Some poke through the ground, but those are from the underside of the icosphere. Now instead of offsetting our curves in this direction, we actually want to add a sample nearest surface node. Plug in our original scene all the way over here. Set this to vector so we can sample our position vector. And the sample position should actually be offset by this new random vector we have. If we plug that into the position of our set position node, we can see that the curves are connecting to nearby surfaces now. And we can decrease the range at which they can do this with the scale node right here. I'm going to lower the density again now that we don't need to visualize this anymore. And take a moment to organize things. Now we want to sample the normals at each point and average them. I'm going to add another sample nearest surface. Once again set it to vector, and this time we want to plug in our normals. We again want to sample our scene geometry here. And we can leave the sample position default because we'll be doing this after the set position has occurred. And add a points of curve node. Using this, we can sample each endpoint of our curve individually and average them together. For example, if you look at the sample nearest by itself, you can see that each of the endpoints actually has different values. And using the evaluate at index, we can check the value of one endpoint for the whole curve. Add a mix node to blend these together. And this gives us the direction that our electricity should arc in. Let's subdivide our curve so it has three points. Add another set position. And this time check where the spline parameter index is one, and this will select our midpoint. We can now scale this mix node by some value and put that into our offset. And now you can see that as we change this, we have this arcing direction for all of our curves. Now let's say we want to animate this. We can add a scene time node and plug seconds into the scale. But the issue is that they keep growing forever. We can put a fraction node here, so once we get one second in or this scale reaches one, it will be set back to zero and just repeat like this. Because we don't want all of our curves to move at the same time, let's add a random value between 0 and 1 to this seconds count before it goes into the fraction node. And be sure to add a named attribute and plug in our curve index. Now you can see that all of our curves are animating out of sync, but because each one still follows a pattern that oscillates every second, our animation actually loops perfectly every second. By dividing our seconds before it goes into this add node by some value, we can slow down the animation, say by 5 times, and now the animation will loop perfectly every 5 seconds, which just so happens to be the length of our animation here. Now our curves are obviously growing way too slow, but we want to make them faster without changing this 5 second period that they're repeating. If we imagine the rate of growth, it looks something like this, going from 0 to 1 and then immediately back to 0, whereas we want it to look something more like this. The curves should just not be moving for most of the time, and then for a much shorter period of time, they should grow from 0 to 1. We can once again use a map range node for this, and by increasing our from min value, we can make it so the curves are animating for half of this 5 second period, 10% of this 5 second period, etc. I'm going to set this to maybe 0.95. And this value here can be treated as sort of the age of the curve as it goes from 0 to 1. If we want the curves to maybe arc less or start out with a bit of an arc to them, we can add another map range here. Leave from min and from max between 0 and 1, but we can now change these to min and to max values to control the starting arc amount and the ending arc amount. In addition to this, we can use a float curve to make the curves either start faster and slow down at the top or vice versa. 
And we also want to delete our curves wherever their age is zero, so the non-animating curves aren't actually present in the scene. And because we store this curve index before we ever actually make these curves, we can actually do this before we ever instance curves on these points. So just check where age is less than some very small epsilon, like 0 0.001. And then we want to delete our curves if they are too far from our ecosphere or their age is very close to zero. If we want to add a random amount that the curves may arc, we can add another random value node down here and be sure to increase the seed so it is different from this random value. And we can plug that into this map range here where we are dictating the maximum scale our curves can approach. And organize this a little bit. And we should probably store a named attribute for the age of our curves so we can use that in our shader later. So just set this to float and plug in our age. Let's make these curves actually curved now. I'm going to resample them to have four points and then set the spline type to NURBS. This is a trick I use all the time just to round out curves. And if you want to tweak the animation at all, you have a lot of parameters to play with. You can change the period at which the animation loops. You can change the percentage of that period that the curves will be alive or dead for. You can even increase the number of the curves just by increasing the density of your distributed points. So yeah, just experiment and find what works for you. Our curves are looking a bit too clean to be electricity, so I'm going to add another set position node. Sample a noise texture with the position vector. Subtract 0.5 from the color to make it between negative and positive values. Scale it so we can change the intensity of it, and plug that into the offset for our new set position. Now there are a couple issues. One is that it's still setting the position of our four sample points. So we can now resample our NURBS curve, and I'm going to set this to length, so we can specify the length of our segments. By setting this to something like 0 0.01, you can have these really high resolution curves. And by increasing the detail and roughness of your curves, you can make something that's a bit more like realistic electricity. Since I'm going for something more stylized though, I'm going to lower the detail and the scale of our curves. And if we pause, we can see our new issue, being that the endpoints of the curves are actually being offset away from our mesh. To fix this, we can add a spline parameter node, plug the factor into a float curve, and make sure the middle is at 100% while the endpoints are both at zero. If we plug this into our scale node, you can see that our endpoints are now attached to our mesh again. We want to put another multiply node after this so we can control the strength of our noise texture again. And we probably don't want this to be incredibly strong when the curves first appear because they are very close to the surface of the mesh. To fix this, we can just map range our age again, and this will control the minimum and maximum strength of the noise. If you want, you can use another float curve for this for greater control, but I don't think it's too necessary here. And now our curves look something like this. Lastly, we need to convert these to meshes so we can actually render them and put shaders on them. So just add a curve to mesh node. For the profile, I'm actually going to use a curve line here, and I'm going to set the endpoints to be between negative one and one on the X. I'm gonna change the curve radius to make it way thinner because it's way too extreme right now. And to do shader stuff with this, we need to make some kind of UVs. Luckily, the factor from our curve goes from zero on one end to one on the other, and that's going to be one axis of our UVs and the factor for our profile curve will be the other, because this line here is being mapped along the curve. So if we capture attributes for each of these curves, and plug in our spline parameter factor, you can see that one of these gives us one axis for our UVs, and the other one gives us the other axis. We can combine these with a combined XYZ node, and we have our UVs. We just need to store them with a named attribute node. Last, we need to add a material. I'm going to call it electricity, and we need to set this material here. Now for my effect, I did use hand-drawn textures, but don't let that deter you. We're going to keep it super simple and still mostly rely on procedural techniques to make it actually pop. You don't need any texturing experience at all to create these textures. Alright, so to start I just drew some squiggles to get like a general shape, and then I just sort of add material to that and carve away at it with a big brush. Um, I didn't actually use a drawing tablet for this, even though I do have one. I just wanted to show that you could get away with not using any kind of like extra tools or anything like that. So this is just using my uh, mouse. 
because the lightning is very stylized, you can really push these more like exaggerated shapes. Uh, just make it look spiky and interesting, uh, as long as it just has some nice details that are going to show up in the final effect. Here what I'm doing is using a thinner brush to create these thinner little bits that chain out of the like main branch of electricity. Um, I also use the eraser tool to just carve out some holes a bit later and uh, you kind of want a good mix of like your big sharp bits and your kind of like round negative space. But uh, once you finish that up you can go ahead and just export it and hop back over to Blender. So back in Blender, before you actually get into the shader stuff, I want to go to the compositor. I have a simple setup here. It's similar to the one in the last video, but it's not too important. What we really want to do is add an image node up here. We want to open this electricity sprite that we just drew, and we want to make an SDF from this. Add a dilate and erode node, set this to feather, and change the fall off to linear. As we increase the distance, you can see that we get this sort of bevel-like effect. I'll set this to something like 64. Duplicate it, and we want to get the interior distance as well, so set this one to negative 64. If we then mix these together with a 50% factor, you can see that it represents both the interior and exterior distance, but we do have a bit of a weird border between the two, which might not show up due to YouTube compression. We'll see. To fix this though, you can just add another dilate erode node. Change the top one to one and the bottom one to negative one, and that border between the two should go away. And now we can just save this image as our electricity SDF. Get rid of the viewer node, and go to shading. We want to add a couple attributes to get some variables from our geometry node setup, namely our UVs and our age. If we plug our UVs into an image texture and open up this new SDF we've created, it should look something like this. If you created the SDF with any other program, you would probably want to change this to non-color, but because we made it in an sRGB color space, we just want to leave it on sRGB. And if we plug in a greater than node, you can see that we can actually threshold our lightning bolt to make it fade in and out. If we add a mix shader, and mix between a transparent and emissive material, we can plug our age into this threshold to make our lightning work. I'm going to make our lightning thicker. And there are a couple of issues. Namely, when our lightning first appears, it is way too thick, and we can use the trusty map range to fix this. By leaving from min and from max between 0 and 1, we can now control the starting threshold and the ending threshold for our lightning. We might want to set the starting threshold to something like 0.4-ish. And our lightning also fades out quite a few frames before the curve actually goes away, so we can lower our 2 max value to maybe something like 0.7 or 0.8. And now the animation on our electricity looks much more natural. For the colors, I used a texture coordinate node, and I separated the XYZ for the generated coordinates. Because the generated coordinates go between 0 and 1 based on the hitbox of our object, it's very helpful for creating automatic gradients when combined with the color ramp node. I want the bottom to be a, a deeper purple, while towards the top it becomes slightly more magenta just to contrast with our object a bit. And with that we have our electricity effect. And here's this final tutorial version compared to the original that I made. Obviously I spent a lot more time tweaking things and getting it to look just right, but I'll leave that up to you. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for the support on the last video. I decided that I will actually be uploading these tutorial effects to Gumroad for free to download. And that includes both this effect that you see right here as well as the end result of the previous tutorial. Those are both on my Gumroad right now. But uh, yeah, I hope you learned something, and thank you so much for watching.